Earlier this week, the Illinois Department of Public Health announced that they're going to be adopting the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's COVID-19 reporting standards. Uh, and looking back two years ago, uh, it was interesting to see the uh, the levels of reporting that they were uh, they were putting out, and just the the need for even uh, deeper types of numbers and more context instead of just all of the. Uh, you know, total positive cases and whatnot, uh, and I was uh, asking time and again for updates on hospitalizations and COVID hospitalizations and ICU availability. And then we started getting more of that data on a regular basis, uh, but now it seems that the data sets have completely changed now two years into this, and we've seen yet a little bit of an increase in COVID cases, uh, but uh, as we've been uh, tracking that here with Springfield's Morning News on WMAY, good morning, I'm Greg Bishop. Uh, the governor was asked yesterday, yesterday uh, about uh, whether or not Illinois is going to go back to requiring masks. Uh, and this is what he had to say when asked about this at a uh, separate event in Chicago yesterday, asked about mask mandates. Here's uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker uh, again from uh, yesterday. And so we are seeing hospitalizations stabilized at a relatively low rate. And again, we're watching those numbers very closely. You've got this uh, situation uh, and whether or not the governor is going to implement different types of mandates, we shall see. Uh, but you have other COVID-19 headlines, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention extending the mask requirements for airplanes, uh, at least for a few more weeks beyond when it was supposed to lift. Uh, but where are we at now and where are we going? You're hearing uh, you know, some concern that there could be more mitigations announced or maybe not. Who knows? But is it time now to reflect upon the past two years? Uh, a report that's out now uh, gives Illinois an F. And uh, this report, uh, it's uh, reviewing all 50 states and the District of Columbia uh, and ultimately shows that uh, Illinois got an F compared to other states. This, again, is from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, to talk more about this, uh, Ted Dabrowski, he, he looks at numbers, he analyzes numbers, he's the president of WirePoints, he joins us now. Uh, Ted, thanks for taking time. This report is uh, something that is a first, right? We really haven't seen this type of uh, comparative analysis of state by state to see what states did versus uh, what states didn't do and the outcomes when it comes to health outcomes, education outcomes, and economic outcomes. Uh, from what you've seen in this report from the uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, what's the takeaway here, Ted? Good morning. Hey, good morning, Greg. Thanks for having me on. No, look, you know, from the beginning of this of this pandemic, we always argued at WirePoints and a lot of other people did too, that we need to add up not just the the lives lost because of COVID, but all the, the costs, both in lives and livelihoods, of all the mitigations we're doing. Uh, we need to add the whole picture to see whether we're doing, you know, doing good or actually making things worse. And, and you know, two years later, we're finally getting some kind of results like that. And you know, these guys, some guys from Chicago, University of Chicago, Stephen Warren, and another person, put together all this data looking at the, the COVID cost of, of mortality rates, but then all the costs from from the lockdowns to the school closing, you know, what happened to the economy? What happened to kids' education? And when you add up all that stuff, you know, and, and they came up with a with a methodology and, and adjusted for things to make things like for like, they found that Illinois had the fifth worst performance in the country. So, um, you know, all that all that pain we had by from some of the strictest lockdowns, from keeping our schools closed for so long, uh, didn't really help us move up the, in the rankings of a fewer deaths we actually were middling so lots of pain and and, and, not, and little to show for it well and, and talk about i guess the comparison here because you know one thing that uh, was was pretty evident even after the first six months or so is that some states decided to kind of go their own way uh and while the cdc had recommendations and guidance you know people could look at that and follow it themselves uh but uh, some states decided to, to just not go with the the lockdown mentality uh, and when I talked with one of the researchers, Ted, uh, they said it wasn't just the, you know, the mandates that were put into place by certain governments, either local or state. It was also the the messaging that was being sent out uh, and that messaging being, you know, either uh, enhanced fear of the virus and only focusing on the virus rather than overall wellness and health. 
uh, versus, you know, hey, go out there and live your life and live it uh, comfortably and um, uh, with, uh, with caution that there's this virus out there. Uh, and different approaches by different governors seems to have uh, led to just totally different outcomes. Uh, you guys, uh, of course, using this report, uh, and it's the first report of its kind, at least from my understanding, uh, you guys looked at uh, just the comparison that they had of the numbers from Florida and Illinois. Florida got a lot of heat, Ted, a lot of heat. I mean, most of the corporate press uh, was was blasting Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, for various uh, approaches he was taking to you know, be more laissez-faire, uh, so to speak. Um, but uh, ultimately, here we are now, two years later. What What can we say about those outcomes compared to Illinois? Yeah, I think, you know, I think Florida took the approach and so did some other states that, you know, we, you know, that the guy, that the guys at the top don't know everything. You know, you can't impose all these mandates and, and fear. And, and, you know, we in, in Illinois, that's what we did. We scared everybody. We shut so many things down. We kept our schools closed. We kept masking our kids far longer than everybody else. A place like Florida and DeSantis said, wait a minute, we're going to, we're going to try to manage this thing so that we don't destroy more lives, more well-being. Uh, destroy kids' education, put put kids further behind, increase poverty. So they took a what, what I'd call a more balanced approach. And so when you look at it, you know, a place like Illinois, uh, both Florida and Illinois were about tied when it comes to mortality from COVID. So about the same, but but Florida Florida got an A compared to Illinois' F in the study. Florida was ranked sixth best in the country. Uh, Illinois was 46. And uh, the big reasons why is because you know. Uh, Florida had an unemployment rate that was much, much lower throughout the pandemic. They kept their businesses open more, and they also kept their schools open. Their, their schools were open over 90 percent of the time, where in Illinois is, is lower than 40 percent of the time. So you look at you look at the reaction, you look at you know how strict we were, and then end up with the same same uh, mortality rate as, as, as Florida. You see that they came out winners. People people were better off overall, and uh, you know that should teach us a lesson that. You know, uh, you know, heavy-handed, top-down government, you know, ideas and, and mitigations don't necessarily work, and uh, they shouldn't use fear to, to in, in enforce those rules that they have. We're talking with Ted Dabrowski here with Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News and Talk at 645. I'm Greg Bishop. About 34 degrees out there as the sun comes up. But, Ted, do um, you think lawmakers at the Illinois State House are going to delve into this data to do that comparative research, to do that comparative analysis and um, guide policies moving forward when it comes to dealing with uh, infectious diseases? You know, I, I don't know if they will. Uh, they should. They should have stepped in long ago and taken away Governor Pritzker's executive orders, which he's still using now. Um, they should. They should have. But what I do know and what I do think is that uh, as people get to know this and they get to see that you know Florida got an A and Illinois got an F and that you know you can do things differently, uh, that the people aren't going to put up with it. You got to wonder if um, you know again if, if mitigations are, 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 are well. Let me put it this way: uh, they're going to the governor's going to have to prove that masks need to be worn. I think uh, things like that. So we'll see whether people can put up with us again or not. Ted Dabrowski with us from Wirepoint. Uh, coming back, Ted, I want to talk about universal basic income, uh, air some of what was uh, discussed in the committee last week uh, where it was revealed that the state has a program that they uh, are looking to enact for the Metro East area, but you've also got the city of Chicago uh, set to have their guaranteed income pilot program set up. So is this a good policy? Is it really going to help? Uh, we shall see. We'll have Ted Dabrowski with wire points with us next segment as well here on Springfield's Morning News. I'm Greg. Starting later this month in Chicago, they're going to have people apply for a lottery. And winners of that lottery will get to take part in a universal basic income test program, a pilot program, guaranteed income. Is there a difference between guaranteed income and basic universal income? I don't know. I think it might get into semantics there, but um, it's something that uh, Chicago is looking to do. And uh, it's going to cost Chicago taxpayers and actually federal taxpayers, because I believe this is coming from the federal uh, COVID relief dollars. It's going to cost uh, about, uh, what, 30, $31 million or so. Uh, this is a large program. $31.5 million are setting aside for this pilot program. They've got some parameters laid out. Uh, including that uh, individuals that want to take part in this, only one per household. Uh, they have to be below uh, 250% uh, of the federal poverty level. 
uh, which equates to about $57,000 for a family of three. Uh, and uh, they would get $500 a month. For how long? We shall see. I guess till the funds dry up. Uh, but uh, that's in Chicago. So the city of Chicago is going to be managing that one. It was revealed earlier this uh, in, in the budgeting process last week that uh, lawmakers are looking at uh, their own uh, basic income, universal guaranteed income program for the Metro East area. And uh, not many details provided. Uh, we got Ted Dabrowski on the line here, and uh, we'll uh, get to that in a moment. But I did want to share a bit of what uh, ultimately came out of a uh, House committee whenever Republicans revealed this in the Democrats' budget. Uh, here's uh, State Representative Ryan Spain and House Majority Leader Greg Harris discussing these issues of uh, guaranteed income. $3.6 million of GRF allocated for a guaranteed income pilot. What is that? It is a test program in Metro East to determine whether, and you've seen these around the country, so it's a, it's a, uh, a small you know, program in, in a specific locale to test uh, the outcomes of delivering, you know, guaranteed income to a small set of, subset of people, as opposed to, you know, the patchwork of um, them trying to get, you know, other sources of income through SNAP or TANA for the earned income tax credit and that kind of thing. Are those um, beneficiaries of the program then ineligible for SNAP and TANF and any of the other assistance programs? I would imagine they are if they exceed the uh, requirements related to income for those. So what, how do we know what those income, not the TANF and SNAP, but what are the, I mean, I've heard this called basic universal income. What is the uh, income the, that will be allocated to people that participate in the program? I think that has to be developed by DHS. I know there are different cities around the state. They're trying this in different areas and there's different definitions. Uh, so I don't believe that's developed. So again, uh, we don't know yet all the parameters of uh, Illinois' program, but they passed it as part of the budget to spend $3.6 million for the Metro East area. Uh, Ted Dabrowski, president of WirePoints, with us on Springfield's Morning News here for about uh, three and a half minutes. Ted, uh, is this a good program, a good policy, or, I mean, it's, we got an election coming up. Uh, does that play into this at all? What's going on here, and are these types of programs uh, showing results in other areas where it may have been implemented? No, I, I don't think this is a good program at all. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of attempts to do these kind of things across the world, testing out whether giving people money for doing nothing will work. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of good arguments against it. You can, you can understand kind of this, this whole thing of, oh, let's just give people money and we'll help poverty and things like that. But, you know, there's, there's a record number of, of job openings in the country, 11 million jobs. And, um, you know, this is a great time. This is the best time for job seekers ever. People should be incentivized to go look for work, not to not look for work. And so, you know, this kind of thing, I think, is destructive. It puts people out of the workforce if they, if they become reliant on it. Uh, you know, once you're out of the workforce for too long, it's really hard to get back in. And I also think it lets the politicians off the hook. You know, it, it's easier to hand out people, hand out money than to make the economy grow and thrive. And you know, people need work to have meaning in their lives. They, it's not just money. They need work uh, and, you know, and, and a reason to, to live. And, and, and work is what that does. This is all at taxpayer expense, uh, either through federal taxpayer dollars or state taxpayer dollars. Uh, and, and when it comes to other types of uh, subsidy programs, Ted, like, you know, uh, what, what people colloquially call food stamps, uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that, that's meant for food. Those dollars are meant to go to food, and there's that, that system that's set up to require that. Uh, TANF, another one. I mean, you've got uh, the Temporary Assistance uh, for Needy Families program. You've got uh, uh, LIHEAP, uh, the you know Low Income Heating Assistance Program. These programs that have dollars specifically geared towards the basic needs of life. It seems that they want to take that away and just give people a, a, a not a not a blank check, but cash money to spend how they want. Is that responsible? No, I think it's irresponsible. And, and you know, I think it's you know a lot of people have this dream that that the basic income would just replace all those programs. You know, libertarians say, just get rid of all those you know, support programs and only have basic income, give people money. But you know that won't work. And it, it also will fall on his face because that means you take away money from elderly to give to young. You take money away from the people who are disabled and give it to the able-bodied. Um, it just would never work. And so 
I think it's a, I think it's just really wrongheaded. Uh, and, and I think you've also seen that in most studies, poverty stays around the same number everywhere, regardless of whether these programs come in or not. So they don't really work. It's just, I think, another, another good marketing tool, sadly, of, of, of being able to hand out money and, uh, and get more votes. Ted Dabrowski, WirePoints. Again, the website is wirepoints.org. Is that right? No, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yes, just just making sure. I wasn't sure if it .com or .org. Either way. Uh, all right. Wirepoints.org. Go check it out. They definitely uh, get on their mailing list as well. Uh, they put out uh, incredible content, good analysis. Greatly appreciate you taking the time with us this morning, Ted. Thank you, Greg. Take it care. is Springfield's Morning News now, 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll talk with the uh, Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police next. From the Fly SBI Studio.